license. And the license we got permits us to use four ARFCNs. ARFCN is a physical uh, frequency on GSM. Um, and uh, we are limited to a transmit power of 100 milliwatts on each of these ARFCNs. Um, if you remember a couple of slides earlier, I said that our equipment can do up to two watts, so we're running at 20%, uh, 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 sorry, we're running at 1 20th of, of that power right now. Um, the, uh, the mobile phones themselves, they all can also transmit at least two watts. So we are really running this at very low scale. And this also explains why sometimes the coverage is poor and you know, your voice quality is poor because you, know, you get you know, uh, uh, a high error rate because the transmit power is relatively low. So, but this is all we could get for this event. Um, the antenna height is restricted to three meters. Uh, luckily, the license did not specify above which reference level. So we. <laughs> Well, in the Netherlands, you could actually believe they meant above sea level, but we don't know. <laughs> um, but so what we did is, well, oh, there's this nice hill. OK, let's go up the hill and put it there. And we put it at less than three meters on top of the hill, and it was OK. Um, in case operators get any interference, we have to shut down. That's basically also a condition. Uh, so far, we did not get any complaints. Uh, the regulatory authority was here, inspected the site, looked at our installation. And uh, they were quite happy when they left. So um, apparently, everything is fine. So the setup is we have two of these PS11 units. Each one has two transceivers. Um, this is the technical details in case you are you know, uh, doing some you know, on-air listening, what, what's happening. The BTS0 runs on, uh, well, 121, 123. Um, and it has location area code 1. The other one is the other side. So, the BTS-0 faces, um, well, the campground where the lake is located. And the BTS-1 uh, faces basically this part, this side of the hill, up to you know, the, the lock pickers and the open BSD uh, uh, tent. Uh, the antennas are mounted back to back on a tree. I have pictures right now. And uh, the two BTSs share a single E1 link. So this, this is the two BTSs located at the bottom of a tree, you know, just uh, tied them to the tree at the bottom. You have lots of cables going in and out. The black ones are radio cables. The gray one is the E1. The antennas are you know, put against the tree using uh, duct tape. Uh, please notice the uh, special um, you know, PET, uh, PET bottle uh, back here which is glued between the tree and the antenna. Because the tree is not straight, it is slightly angular. And we don't want to you know, cover some airplanes up there, but we want to actually go down on the area. Um, so that, again, is uh, from a different angle, the two antennas you know, facing uh, to two different sides. And then we have a Linux PC running the OpenBSC software. It uses the MISDN driver. We have about 60 meters of Cat5 cable for the E1 line between the BTSs and our tent, where the PC is located. The network ID we use is 204-42, which is uh, Netherlands and the operator called 42. 42 was unused, and the regulatory authority said, well, you can use it. Um, so um, the typical CPU use we have is less than 5%, and uh, the resident set size in RAM is somewhere around 3 megabytes, just to give you an impression how little resources computationally you need to operate a GSM network these days. It's just, you know, back in the 80s, you needed these massive racks uh, full of discrete TTL components. Um, and today, the, the machine here is, is some, some, I think, three-year-old Opteron with 1.6 gigahertz or something, Not, nothing too fancy. So, and then you end up well, in the tent, and inside this tent, um, in our GSM tent, we have that actual machine, which looks like, uh, I thought I had a picture of the machine, but I don't, I'm sorry. Um, some are missing from the slide. Well, it's, it's a PC, right? It's a black PC, it has a couple of cables coming out of it. So, um, nothing too fancy. The registration procedure, I think a number of people have already been going through it. Uh, if you have registered to our network, you will know uh, when you first log onto the network, you get an SMS message. Um, and in that message, we will state a URL, your IMZ, and an authentication token. You go to the website, you enter your data, um, 
and this enables you for the network. If you do not go to the website and enter your data, you will never, ever get any other SMS from us or register again, be able to register again to our network. Because uh, that's sort of um, the precondition we made to make sure that nobody accidentally ends up on our network. Right? There are people that do not belong to this camp in the vicinity, like uh, camping guests and, and whatever other people. Um, and all they get is the single SMS. And if they don't do anything else, then uh, nothing will happen. Um, however, if you receive the SMS and register, then we will permit you to use our network. Um, and uh, you can uh, make and receive phone calls, establish SMS, and so on. Now, um, how, what can you do? Well, yeah, SMS, phone calls. What can you do to play? Well, um, you can use AirProbe, which is the next talk just coming up, or other tools to actually decode and listen to the GSM communication. Because now it is legal, right? Um, uh, first of all, we do not use any of the encryption or authentication that um, uh, GSM networks typically use. So everything is plain text in our case. And secondly, we do not use frequency hopping, which also makes it technically more challenging to uh, do eavesdropping on GSM uh, communication. So basically, in this network, we lower the entrance barrier to hack it artificially right? to, to basically show what you can do um, you know, if in one or two years the encryption has been completely broken, not only theoretically or algorithmically, but also practically, and then people can do that even on other networks which actually do have the encryption and authentication mechanisms installed. So since we do not have that, you can do all of that now um, uh, as you want. And also, we don't do SMS filtering. So you can send any RPDU to any other phone. Um, you know, so you, using a data cable or a GSM modem, you can send all kinds of, you know, say, well, the length is longer than the packet and, and you know, play tricks like that. We just transparently forward what you send the network to the recipient, and uh, that's about it. Um, so, well, um, what you can do is to help us to obtain, uh, to test OpenBSC under higher load. The load so far is very, very, very low. You know, nobody wants to make calls. Nobody's sending SMSs. It's, uh, it's uh, ah, well, uh, I, I would have expected much more um, uh, use of the actual network. But obviously, by doing so, you also help us to obtain real-world protocol traces, which we can also use to you know, discover certain strange behaviors with certain phones, which probably might have security implications or not, um, but anyway are interesting. The statistics so far, well, you see some fixed me's here. We weren't able to finish the statistics um, uh, so far. Statistics module is not finished. But we, more than 1,100 phones try to register to the network so far. More than 450 phones have actively completed the registration procedure. More than 1,000 SMS messages were you sent. You know, like what, 450 phones? Only 1,000 SMS messages is two messages per phone. Come on, what's this? Um, you can do better than that. Use more bandwidth. Um, sorry? There are no services. Well, the services that you can send messages to other people here. Um, um, well, I can understand that you need this, and I also need to implement this. But unfortunately, the regulatory authorities